as Wafa Al-Abridat. You are listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Side note, even though we are all at home, we wanted to bring you valuable content. So this episode of the podcast is brought to you over Zoom. Please bear with the sound quality. Thank you. Her Highness Sheikh Antasar al-Sabah is a force of nature and a woman with sky-high ambition and a real love for life. With the mission to bring peace to Arab women, she founded Intisar Foundation, a UK-based charity that works with women affected by war to relieve their trauma through the creative approach of drama therapy. With the aim of healing one million Arab women, Sheikh Antasar balances her time by running four companies, three non-for-profits, and also shares her life openly and candidly on social media. We see her garden, we see her learn, we see her host some incredible women on her very own platform. But we mostly see her live her authentic self every day. Welcome, Sheikh Antasar. I wanted to ask you, how are you doing during COVID? What have you been doing with your time and what different phases have you had since the beginning? Now, when COVID first started and when, not when first started, when it started, I didn't take it seriously, Amana. I didn't take it seriously enough. I actually wa- went to Amman because we had a group, we had two groups of women graduating from the drama therapy um, program we were doing with them. And uh, the meet, well, the, the graduation was, you know, put in place or, you know, I was supposed to meet, see them months in advance because it's about a three to four months. And they were so, so excited, I couldn't say no. So that's where I say I didn't take it seriously. And I looked at uh, Jordan at the time, and it didn't have a lot of cases. So I got on the plane, and I went to Jordan, and I sat with the women, and they graduated, and they were so happy. And I, they got to share their stories with me, uh, their successes, how they've changed their lives. And then I came back to Kuwait, and that's when it hit I think like a couple of days after they closed the airport. And then they said, uh, no, you know, like the government declared that the government's shutting down. No one, the government don't go to the office. So my team, I could see or I could feel they were scared. So we decided to shut down the office too. Honestly, I slept till about nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. And... Um, It took me by surprise how much I slept the first three days. And that's when I realized I'd been running and running and running and running, traveling here, traveling there. I was supposed to go to Belgium. I was supposed to meet the EU president and there was a lunch in my honor. And then the parliament, the EU parliament shut down so I couldn't go. It's like, yay, thank God I would have been stuck in Europe. So things just, like I had four trips in the next two weeks and they all got canceled and no work. Well, no going to the office. And so the first, I think three to four days, I slept like 10 to 11 hours a day. And this is not like me. And I just did nothing, literally, I did nothing except go walk in the garden and come back and go to sleep, watch TV, which, It's not something I usually do. Go on my Instagram, but not post much. I was just savoring this forced slowdown of my life. I think day four, I started to realize, or three or four, like I can go into the garden. And I started going in the garden, but I didn't post. Because to me, I was having so much fun. I was so enjoying this lockdown and I felt very guilty about enjoying it because people were petrified. And then I was smiling and saying, yay, if I do get it, that's fine, but I'm not going to get it and I'm going to enjoy my life. And so I started uh, gardening and I haven't gardened this way since 2005. No, 
about 2004, 2000, when I moved to this house, I did the whole garden. And then I started working. So I can't garden anymore. I can't garden. I, only weekends and I get too tired because I just want to rest and do a massage and sit with the girls. And I used to work long hours. So I do three or four hours of gardening. That's not enough for gardening. You need more. And so I depended on the gardeners. And yeah, well, the garden was nice. I'm not saying it wasn't nice. It was beautiful. But it it wasn't singing. I use the word singing. When I had the chance to really go into the garden and then look at everything I planted and then realize I'm getting very tired with this gardening. Not tired, I'm bored, tired as I'm, it's, it's, it's very labor intensive. And I started looking and suddenly I, I discovered permaculture and someone called it the lazy man's gardening. How do you garden? to get the best out of the garden, but not to do so much effort. And I discovered no-till, and I discovered sustainable gardening, and food forest, and all of these things I wouldn't have discovered had I been going to the office from 9 to 6, or 9 to 4, 9 to 5, whatever timing I would go. Then I, after like a week, I realized maybe I should put something on my Instagram. So I put a little bit, and people loved it. And then I put a little bit more. And then they started telling me how watching me having fun made them less anxious. So there's no shame in enjoying it. Because I was ashamed that I was having so much fun and people were so scared. So when we talk about your team, because you refer to them a lot, and, and it feels to me, especially when you talked about how much you used to work with them, how big is your team? Because we are also like a very career driven podcast. So we want to understand the ins and outs of business. So are they working on the Intasar Foundation? Are they working on Nuer? Are they working on personal projects? Well, I have um, three for profit, which is Prismology, which is a body care brand based on the healing properties of color. I have Intasar's, which is jewelry with a purpose or jewelry made made for love. I have Ibarra, which is the power of words on jewelry. And I have Yellow Submarine, which is a creative agency that feeds a nowhere. And then I have three nonprofits, which are Nuer, Bariq, and the foundation. So between all, and, and we don't have big teams in any of the entities. I refuse to have big teams. I like to have very smart teams. So all in all, we have about about 48, 47, 48 people. This is the first time I hear about all of these. Usually in the other interviews, you focus on Intasar Foundation or, or Nuer, but this is the first time I, I see the seven, which is amazing. That shows that you are, you know, you love starting companies and, and possibly growing them. And my question is, where did this hunger for work come to you? Because as you're communicating, I'm hearing that work is very important to you. You need to achieve you need to have purpose in your life. I can sense that. Again, just reading your energy, you work hard. You're not doing a couple of hours a day. It feels like you're committed uh, to these organizations and to growing them. Where did this love for work or this hunger or this motivation for work come from? The truth is, I have no idea. But I know that, you know, I, 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 I didn't work in the normal sense until my daughter, my youngest daughter, went to uh, nursery. And before then, I used to be a mother and uh, a housewife. But I used to not cook all the time, but I used to take my what I do seriously. So with the children, I would actually be a mother. With the house, I would be a housewife. I would read. I, will, I would do things. I was never... You know, I tried to be the one, you know, one of these ladies who go to coffee shops and chat. It never lasted long. I just got very bored. I have this, I've always had this innate want to make a difference. And this... Like it's like, it's like, it's like a seed in you. Exactly. And, and I, I, know, I think I know where it comes from. And also this, you know... From, from forever, a reluctance to be with the people. I can't do blah. I can't do just sitting and gossiping and, and having coffee. I love being with my friends and having coffee. 
but I can't do it daily. I've ne- I mean, I try to do that daily and I lasted, I think, a couple of months in all my life. And then I just dropped off. I said, oh my God, I don't come home. I sit with, with these women and it's fun. But so you so fun. Fun. Yeah, after a while, you Not even that. It took me away from what I thought was more important, which is my house and my daughters. And then I realized I don't see my daughters much. And they were growing up. And so I dropped out of that circle. And I realized this is not for me. If they love it, fantastic. I wish them all the best. It wasn't me. I am made for my inner circle, not my outer circle. And I never went back and I never did it again. And I, I don't like it. It's not me. It's just not me. I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just very wrong for me. Did you have a mentor or did you read a book or were there women or men around you that had such strong work ethic and you were like, I want to be like that, I want to model them or it's just something that you feel has been, is inside of you? You know, my mother takes what she does very seriously. So when she cooks, she takes it seriously and does a lot and she's a fantastic cook. When she's socializing, she takes it seriously and she does really well. So... Most people in Kuwait know my mother because this, to her, is her duty. To socialize, to visit people. This is her duty, and she does it, like seriously, she does it to her max. And when you see someone always giving their best, you you learn from it. My father, since I remember, six o'clock he's out, he goes to work. And then after he goes for like a few hours to work, maybe three hours, four hours, and then he goes to see his camels or the other way around. He'll go to his camels first and then go to work. And he, and he was diligent in that. He, it wasn't like, oh, I'm not going to go to work. I'm just going to go to my camels or I'm just going to go to my camels or going to work and not going to my camels. So he was able to do both because the camels and his, you know, his, his nature is what he loved And work is what he went to do daily. And he took it seriously. I think from a young age, I realized you either take things seriously or you play around. And when you play around, it's not even, it, it's unfair to the, with the gifts that God, God gave us to do nothing with them. So that's incredible because I think that's what makes you so special and fascinating because you very much have a startup mentality I can feel it when you you know you hustle you hustle you push your brands at the same time you're very vulnerable and we see a side of you on Instagram or on social media even actually in the interviews where you're exposed and just being yourself you're very true to yourself and what I see is is women from the royal family it's it's harder I think for them because they're it's very conservative for a woman of that status to be so open and transparent and showcase all aspects of her life, where she lives, what she's doing. I, I'll, I'll say a little bit of that, and then I will ask you a question. Uh, for a long time, I didn't want to be seen. And I thought, oh my God, when people see me, then they're going to think less of me. What are they going to think? I shouldn't be. I was told, why are you doing this? I don't know why I did it. I just thought, why not? Like, seriously, what have I got to lose when I do it? Worst is nothing because I know myself. I don't put my foot in my mouth. And it's not because I don't do it intentionally and I'm very guarded with what I say because I am true. I don't always think about what I'm going to say. It's just I don't put my foot in it whenever I speak. And I'm real. And so when I started getting engagement on social media in the beginning, like, Oh, maybe they're, they're, you know, they're pulling my leg or they're just, you know, because of who I am, they're, you know, they're not being true. They're just, you know, flattering me. And then, no, people really liked it. So the engagement of the followers engaged me more and more. Yes, there's some people who are flattering, but the majority, some of them didn't even know who I was. The majority just thought... Oh my God, I love what you're doing. I have no idea what you're doing. I love what you're doing. And then they'd say, oh my God, we're so sorry. We didn't know it was you. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. And I'm thinking, why are you apologizing? You didn't say anything wrong. My other, my question to you would be, 
how many other women are doing it that are not being paid for it? And the ones that are being paid are not true because it is a facade. How many other non-royals out there are, don't have a facade and are real? If you give me 10, then I'll be very happy. I see. So I think I think the message is it doesn't matter as long as you're real and, and you stay true to yourself and you're authentic. Exactly. Because I know, I, I mean, I, I, I follow a couple of uh, girls and I like what they're doing. And then I realize, yeah, but there's... We all censor what we do. I don't put everything. It, it's not fair that I put everything on me because there's some things that are private. But when I'm always putting censored content it shows do you face any criticism from your family yeah i used to i used to my mother like first time second time what are you doing on social what are you, what are you doing what are you doing and i said what am i doing what am i doing wrong and she couldn't i wasn't doing anything wrong and so she didn't say anything and your daughter and her donkey i said yeah and what about her donkey What will people say? I said, about what? She is with her donkey and her animals. What are people going to say? That she has donkeys and animals? Yeah. Is she doing anything immoral or shameful? I said, if she does anything shameful, I'll be the first one to tell her off. But she's just enjoying her life. She's not doing anything morally wrong. And she's so happy. Exactly. So my mother has stopped. One of my sisters was petrified at the beginning. It's like, don't do that. Don't do that. I said, don't do what? But the worst they can do, they can swear at me and I can block them. But people don't swear and I don't have to block. People, you know, when you're, when you're genuine, people feel it and they love it. And it's inspiring. I saw this amazing video that you posted about how important it is for women to be seen and heard. And that really moved me because the more we are seen and heard, the more we are able to see that we can be ourselves. Every day we get closer to being who we are. And it's okay for us to be who we are, no matter what that shape looks like. So, And that's a very powerful message because we live in so much fear I read a book by Ali Amuro called The Greater Freedom. And it says, there's always this invisible jury. What are people going to say? And you know what? People don't even care as long. They have their own problems to deal with. So it's like, just live your life. Don't worry about this or that or what will this person say? So it's it's always hanging around the heads of a woman from this part of the world. You know, like just keep quiet, be small. Don't be so big. Do you know, it's not even this part of the world because, you know, where, when I spoke about women being uh, seen and heard, I was speaking with a group of eight women that we all did a public speaking, very, very different kind of uh, uh, public speaking uh, training. And it was funny because I am the only Arab one. The, the rest are all, uh, uh, if not English, then European. And you could, you, it was so amazing to see how we all all eight of us, without exception, belittled ourselves and wanted to be invisible. And all of us eight women are accomplished women. I mean, the least accomplished was a director in a 30,000 people firm. So really accomplished women. And we all were scared of being seen and heard. And so it's, I, it's a female, I think it's an inherent female trait because of the wars and, and the troubles in all countries and all cultures, women were always told to hide because, you know, yeah. they get pillaged and everything happens. And so the women are the most vulnerable and the most prosecuted in wars. So they're told to hide and keep quiet and not show themselves. There was danger in being seen and heard. So it, it, that could be one of the reasons why women are shying away from the limelight. Are you interested in developing your own podcast or your own show? We want to help you make that happen. We can assist you with branding, conceptualizing the concept and theme, writing your intro and shooting it, editing your podcast episodes, developing a podcast schedule and theme, and creating social media content for your listeners and followers. 
we want you to have your own platform and space to express your point of view. Contact us on obinehill.com or DM us on Instagram and we'll be here to support you. Now that you brought up war, I, I'm very interested to know how the the war with Iraq, how did that affect you personally? Were you affected by that experience? Uh, I only realized literally just before I did the speech that I was traumatized by it. Know. I didn't know this was trauma. The trauma was bouts of anger all the time, uh, being fearful, feeling unsafe. Before, before the invasion, I had much more courage than I had after. I played small. I won't say I cried easily as much as I had this fog in my mind. And only when I started working, do, I started doing different things from coaching to energy healing, you know, different modalities of, of therapies, like uh, complementary therapies. I think this was one of the biggest things that changed me. I did a training on uh, neuroscience in my brain. It was basically growing alpha or theta. And the whole exercise was to increase alpha in the brain. And it was amazing what happened. I did, I think, like eight or nine sessions of one week each for about three years. I mean, it was intensive. It was 12 hour days for a whole week of being in a little dark room with a small screen with electrodes on the head and working or or relaxing enough to grow alpha and theta. That was a turning point in my life because I started looking at life differently. I What I realized now is, wow, I used to be really small in my head. I, You know, they call it small mind or big mind. I used to be in this very small mind that I, I couldn't see far ahead. I was always worried about, number one, I wasn't, I was holding on to a lot of anger and resentment of people. I wasn't gentle, neither with myself or with others. I was very judgmental. And what I learned in that is to grow your alpha. It's, it's really, really, really interesting. And it's scientific. You want to grow your alpha? Forgive. So I started working on forgiveness. Believe me, it was not easy in the beginning. I was kicking and screaming because I didn't want to work on forgiveness. Yeah, because we, we, we hold on to it. Like, it's, we hold on to it. Like, I, I need to punish the people who hurt me. I can't let go. What I discovered by session seven, it took me, it took me quite a lot of sessions to discover that I was angry at me and I was not forgiving me. And it wasn't like what, let's say Iraq, it wasn't what Iraq did. It's how I reacted and what I thought and, and what I did that I was angry at. What they did is irrelevant to my feelings. And so the anger was towards me, not towards them. And the unforgiveness was towards me, not towards them. I think by session seven. And then after that, I was like flying because I realized, oh, my God, if I can forgive and love me, the sky is the limit. Did it feel like weight off your shoulders and you were light and you were just... I mean, you just said flying, so I'm sure you felt light and you had no baggage. It was so emptying of, not even rocks, of boulders inside of me. And I was able to remove one and throw it away, remove one, throw it. And then and I felt so light. And that's when I started realizing, oh my God, I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of my own love. I'm worthy of my own acceptance. I'm worthy of my own light. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is that not is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Listen to this. 
Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people don't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's just, it's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And again, listen to this, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fears, our presence automatically liberates others. And I think that's what you practice daily. This Now this this quote with, with who you are makes so much sense. This is like probably how you live your life. What I've realized is when I was younger, I was in a way not appreciating who I was in all my aspects, like uh, that I am my father's a daughter, that I am my mother's daughter. I mean, having such a, uh, a big name as my mother and father, I didn't appreciate it. I kept thinking, this is unfair, this is unfair. Other people are not privileged. Why am I privileged? So I undermined the privilege I was in. And then the more I read this quote, I realized something. God does not give things or gifts haphazardly. You are granted a gift because you have a responsibility. I was given the name affluence, abundance, the brain, the drive, being female, being beautiful, charisma. I wasn't given all of that for me to waste it. I was given all of this because there was a job I had to do. And when I realized that this is not a coincidence, I am not lucky. No, I used to think I'm lucky. Other people are not lucky. This is unfair. I realized it's got nothing to do with luck or, un or, or, or no luck. It's got to do with when you're given a big degree, you have a bigger role to play. When you're given a smaller degree, you have a smaller role to play. We are all here in this world to make a difference. And some people have less responsibility than others. And shying away from your responsibility is almost like saying to God, like, seriously, I don't know. I don't think you know what you're doing. I'm not going to use what you gave me. And that's when I realized, seriously, I am ungrateful. I should be grateful to what I have, but I should also be grateful that I have a purpose. I have a mission. I have something to do in this world. And it's not watching TV and it's not drinking coffee every day. Well, I mean, in that way, and I do nothing. I have a bigger purpose. And I have to fulfill that purpose. Otherwise, I'd be in pain. And I was in pain for years. I was in pain because I played small. And once I stop playing small, I'm grateful for what I have, but I've also taken full responsibility of what I have to do. Did you realize all these lessons or this passage that you went through to, to realize all these incredible things during the time you were experiencing all these different therapies? And then how did that lead into Intasar Foundation? So it, it wasn't an overnight realization. I think it was just me with the new insights, I won't say knowledge, it is just insights into what I already know. The new insight, I started chipping at this facade of ungratefulness. I'll only say it ungratefulness that I had. And when I started realizing that, oh my God, I can do something in this world. And I remember the first time someone told me you can do something, I looked at her like she was crazy. Really doing what? Because I didn't realize that I have all the cards to do it. And now I look at her and say, thank you so much for telling me what I needed to know when you came into my life. Because she looked at me, she says, you have a bigger role than what you're doing. And I looked at her like, seriously, 
what's ever going to become out of me? I am a member of the royal family. I'm a, a girl. I'm a woman. I don't work. I, at the time, I was divorced. How am I ever going to get there? Seriously? And I looked at her and said, you're so silly. You're dumb. And then I realized these are my boundaries of not taking responsibility. It's got nothing to do with all of that. So it, 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 it's slowly chipping at my small mind until the bigger mind was, you can make a big difference. And it's got nothing to do with you. Like yesterday, I was telling my coach, she said, how are you? I said, you know what I've realized? I've realized it's got nothing to do with me. And she said, yeah, because she said, we're all here for the bigger picture of supporting other people. We're not here. We, we, you as women, she said to us, uh, public speaking, she said, you as women and as prominent women have a role to play and you have to inspire and mentor and support other women. But mostly you have to become role models for, for women and girls. She said, when, one, of the, one of the things she taught us when we come to public speak is you're not speaking about you. It's got nothing to do with you. You're speaking on behalf of all the people that you are advocating for. So let's say for me, it was on behalf of the million women. She says, it's got nothing to do with you. Not at all. And, uh, and it dawned on me in the past few months that it's got nothing to do with me. And it's only when I removed that fearful ego that I realized it's got nothing to do with me at all. It's got to do with the purpose that I'm here for. And that's why I'm, I, it's so easy for me now to, to speak. Elizabeth Gilbert said this amazing quote once, which is when she writes her books, she feels like she's just channeling her message. She's a vessel. She's like, I'm just the messenger. I'm here to tell these stories. They come through me and I write, 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 write. And it's like, it, it almost feels very holy when you, when you find your purpose and you want to live it. And I want to know what was that moment for you when you decided, okay, I want to build a foundation. Was that your first business or your first non-for-profit or your first project? By the way, you know, I wrote 130 articles and I swear, I look at the articles now and I said, where did that come from? They are so brilliant and I've never written before. No, the thing is, I, and they're in Arabic and I haven't written before. And I look at them and say, wow, these are profound. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, I'm in awe of what I wrote. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah, this, this is definitely channeled. I don't yeah. have this language. Yeah. Where did that come from? And even when they came to copy edit for me, the, the copy editor would say to me, there's so, such little mistakes. And I said, me? I was never good in, in qawaad. And there I am writing, not perfect, but, you know, uh, you know, having that knowledge drop on, on you, on one, I've, I've felt it. I, I've written things sometimes or I've done things. Like the foundation was one of these, God knows how it came. But don't forget, before the foundation, I already started, let's say, Nuware. When I started Nuware, when I started in 2013, talking about positive psychology and positivity, seriously, it was Arab Spring. People thought I was nuts. <laughs> and they would make fun of me. And to me, it made perfect sense. Yeah, why not use positive psychology to support people to change their mindset? Who said you can't? And people look at me like, cuckoo. I choose not to listen to people. When I feel something is good, I continue with it because it's a feel, it's a factor inside of me. It's a feel good factor that tells me if I'm right or wrong. Yeah, it's it's like your inner voice or your gut. Like I have to do this. It's it's calling me. It's exactly. calling me. Like I think uh, I had this chat with Hayal Khalifa a few times, and she said like something is calling you. Like tune into that. And I always. Tell her it's like a radio frequency. So once you hear it, once you're on that radio frequency, it tells you. So when I started Nuwer, I started it against all uh, uh, criticism. And it wasn't encouragement. So there's both. Who do you listen to? 
that's what defines what you do. And after Nuwer, I started Barir. Also, people were saying, seriously, you want to do positive psychology in schools? Like, seriously, do you know how hard it is to go into schools? Do you know people don't change people? And was successful. So I knew that if you worked on the mental wellness of people, they do really well in life. And then uh, 2017, I was approached by the International Committee for the Red Cross to have a roundtable in Kuwait raising awareness and advocating for the plight of Arab women in war. And we did the roundtable and we uh, did recommendations. One of them was to increase mental and physical well-being or mental well-being for women. And I looked at them and I said, who's doing any mental well-being? And that's when horribly I learned that no one's doing anything for women affected by war in the Arab world psychologically. And I thought, okay, so I have to do something. And it started with a small seed. I have to do something. That's all I wanted to do. Do something. I don't know what I wanted to do. I want to support women affected by war psychologically. So I started, I visited Lebanon, spoke to, with the UNHCR there, looked at what was being given to women. And then I realized there's no focus on mental well-being. There's no focus on psychological support. They were mostly on children, not on women. So basically no one looked at women. No one thought about women. They would give them the, 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 the basic need, which is food and shelter, but nothing more. Uh, there was two charities that closed down that supported severely abused women, like raped women from war and all of that. But anyone else traumatized by war, no one even looked at. And so I started looking at what was being given and why there was nothing being given and also why the women didn't want to go to the interventions that they were being offered. And I wanted to do cognitive behavior therapy in the beginning because I know it works. And then I realized I went to this beautiful cognitive behavior therapist. She was a young girl so full of life in Lebanon. And, her, and she was in a, a free and very good charity clinic. And her office was empty. And I, I know we're talking to her. And I realized women don't want to go into a room and talk to anyone. The Arab women and women affected by war does not want to go into a room and close the door. Ditto, like elementary, but no one thought of it. And she didn't want to relive her pain. She didn't want to be stigmatized as crazy. Or her family won't allow her to go because what will the neighbors think? And so we had, I had to think of like the CEO and me, because I already, once I wanted to do something, I hired someone who would be the CEO to take over. And I had plans to, to support uh, a big number of women. And then we, we had to think of something different because the normal therapies are not going to work. So we did, we realized arts would work. So we did a program with art therapy and a program with drama therapy. We eliminated dance therapy because sometimes music and dance, there's an aversion to them. So we did art therapy and drama therapy. The art therapy did well. The, the women who uh, did the, you know, the program, they did well. They were hunched over their artwork, sometimes speaking about their pain, but drawing it and, and, and you know, releasing it gently and slowly. And I was very happy with the art therapy. And then I went to the drama therapy and lo and behold, the women were standing and like, wow, full of life, bigger than life. Giggling, giggling. Women in Shatila camp were giggling. Art therapy there weren't giggling. They weren't touching each other. They were releasing their pain, but they were closed. And drama therapy is like, I am here. Look at me, notice me. I am here. And the amount of giggling these women were doing, it shocked me, beautifully shocked me. They're happy. So did that heal them? Did you feel that there was a bigger impact with the drama therapy than anything else? Yeah, that's why we dropped the art therapy and we continued only drama therapy. 
And uh, it's really amazing. You know, again, that's an insight. What what we're realizing now with drama therapy, it, it touches the three basics of uh, therapy, which is uh, emotional, uh, mental, movement, and uh, expressive. So it's all three. So you're working on all three angles of what people need. And it's the only therapy that takes all three. And that's why we're seeing huge shifts. So walk me through the program. So like, is it a module, like a course, and you send specialists there? How does it work? We've come up with the perfect format. So what we have is between 15 to 80 to 20 women. So it's a small enough group that they, they can get intimate, but big enough that they can share. And then they find their same stories with the other women. It's not a very closed format. So Jordan works slightly different than Lebanon, but it's all about drama therapy, which is theater and psychology mixed. So we do, they do a play. It could be like one group were okay to have people watch the play and one group, they were okay with their families only watching the play in Jordan. They want no one else to watch the play. So if they're more uh, reserved, more conservative in sharing their stories. It depends on the group of women and how open they are to share their stories. They do have to do a play, but it's not about the play. So it's all about the play, but not about the play, because to do the play, number one, they have to share their stories. Number two, they have to do role reversal. So let's say you, you play my role, I play yours. So I play the perpetrator's role, and then I get to see things from a different angle. So it's, it's quite intensive. Uh, There's lots of exercises, there's grounding exercises, there's feeling your emotions, there is how to connect with people. I mean, it's a lot of exercises. There's the empty chair, which they love. So you put someone on the empty chair and you vent whatever the venting is. It could be love, it could be hate. So you vent. So this venting at an empty chair, so you put a person there and you vent and it is you see their faces change because a lot of them have not been allowed to express their anger. So it's it's very interesting. It, it I mean, drama therapy is different in Europe than it is in America. And in India, it's different. In the Arab world, it's different. So far in the Arab world, there's not a lot of drama therapists. I mean, in Lebanon, there's about four or five, and that's the biggest number in the whole of the Arab world. And the good thing is we've, we're just about to sign an NDA. We signed an NDA. We're, we're finalizing with um, UZEK, Kaslik University in Lebanon, to have a minimum of 10 drama therapists graduate from their master's program, because it's a master's program, to be able to work with women around the world. Because another piece of good news is thank you, COVID. Thank you so, so, so very much. What we realized is we can work remotely with women. Uh, Before we always did, you know, like groups, closed groups in a room with the women. With the COVID, we realized, oh my God, we have to do something different. And that's what we did from week one. Now what we do is we do online trainings with the women. Very simple, no more than six, seven women in a group because online it's, it's a different dynamic, but they get to do the exercises and there's a therapist with them the whole time. And even Europe and America, we're ahead of them because they've never done this. So we're actually uh, sharing information with our advisory board on what, what's happening with refugee women and online drama therapy training because no one else is doing it in the world. No, it's 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 so innovative. I was walking today with my mom and I was telling her I was interviewing you and I was like, they are healing women through drama therapy. And I realize even saying it, how innovative it sounds because it's so specific, which I love. It's not vague. It's just this is our formula. And I love that you also have a million women. So what I want to ask you is why a million? And two, how close are you to getting to the million? Like wh- when do you foresee that happening? When I was in my public speaking course, we had to do a one-on-one coaching with a fellow trainee. trainee. And so I was doing a one-on-one with one of the other seven women. And she looked at me and she says, what what do you want to do with with what you're doing? I said, Yanni, we want to support women. She said, give me a number. 
And I looked at her, I said, huh? She goes, give me a number. So I said, a thousand is too little. We can do beyond a thousand, maybe 10,000. And she looked at me, she really thought, I know you can do better. And I looked at her and I said, huh? She goes, give me a number that scares you. And I said, a million. She goes, yeah, that's a good number. Stay with that. I was shaking and I'm thinking, how am I ever getting to a million? I mean, this is huge. I thought I was going to, you know, support a thousand women. A thousand women is a big number. And to take it to a million is like, like pushing all my boundaries. And I thought, yeah, okay, so if I put a million, then I have to work differently. Okay, ah, you know what? I'll put, you know, I'll put, that's my goal. And I'll work towards it. And again, thanks to COVID, it'll be easier to reach the one million women because we'll be doing most of our training online. Wow. And we're perfecting the online training. Like all the therapists, they can be anywhere around the world and they can still do online. So from Lebanon, let's say the majority of our trainers will be in Lebanon because they have the only university in the Arab world that does, does drama therapy. So from Lebanon, they can support Asia, Europe, America, Arab world for sure. So all the Arab women in the, around the world can be part of the one million. So as part of your job to raise funds for this foundation, do you pitch this to potential patrons or are you funding this yourself? So far, I'm funding it. But now we, we want to send about 15 uh, young women to do the master's program. And it, it's not going to be cheap. So we're, we're doing um, uh, funding now and also we're, we're doing research. So we're going to be doing at least two to three uh, high end research on the effect of drama therapy on Arab women because nothing has been done with women and drama therapy on a big scale. So we have an opportunity to highlight all the good that's being done in the Arab world and also that it is, we want to prove with neuroscience, and that's our next one, with neuroscience, how drama therapy can bring changes in the brain of women to allow them to become more peaceful. That is our next goal. This podcast is brought to you by the Women Power Summit. The Women Power Summit is an annual event that hosts more than 2,000 guests to listen, learn, and network with more than 100 plus speakers and industry leaders. The summit creates space for growth, learning, discussion, and collaboration with the means of creating a space where women can support each other, ask questions, be curious, and be inspired. I think it's fascinating that you are such a student of life. With Hayal Khalifa's session, you took out a paper and a pen and you were taking notes. And yeah. a lot of the references that you mentioned in previous interviews show that you are always willing to take a workshop on fermentation, on doing things with your hands, on learning about different subjects, even some professional courses. You talk about your public speaking course, which I think really impacted you as well. Where does this curiosity come from? Because you cover a range of subjects, so you're curious about a lot of things. And where does this hunger for being a student, like you're a student of life, come from? Let me tell you something. I was talking to my daughters. I have four girls. All five of us, whenever, let's say, let's say you, you say something and I don't know what it is, I will open Google and look it up. And all four of my daughters all do the same thing. And it's funny because we think it's normal, but then we realize a lot of people will call you up to say, what did that mean? Like, seriously, just open Google, you'll get to know what that means. Why do I need to ask that question and take someone well, someone's time when it takes less effort to open Google, look it up, and then get more information than what you're going to give me? Unless you're an expert. It's like with the fermentation. I get people saying, oh, but how do I do this? I said, you know, just open YouTube and research it. 
And to me, it's elementary. It's like, how can you just ask someone and take a, you know, just the title when you can learn so much more? But it, it, it's very funny. We're discussing it with my girls and we just found it so funny that we all do the same thing. And it seems like you love to learn. And I feel like if I talk to you a month from now, you'll tell me like, oh, I'm interested in a whole new set of subjects. So this quest for learning, which is, I think when you want to learn, your appetite for life is so high because you're curious, you want to try things, you want to meet people, you want to, there's so much to see. Do you go where you're curious? Yani, what subjects are you interested in? Or is it just based on mood? One thing I've learned about me is when something excites me, I learn everything about it. So before the internet, uh, about 20 years ago, even more maybe, I was in the back of the car going to Bahrain, I remember that. So that must have been about 30 years ago. I was curious about crochet. So I bought books about crochet and I sat in the back of the car, we were driving to Bahrain, crocheting. And I did an intensive personal, you know, like from books into crochet. I had to learn everything about crochet. I know crochet now. I would love to say I do crochet. Not really. I do every, every year I do like that much. But when I like crochet, I just did a lot. Baking, I had to go in all out, all in and learn and learn and learn until I got a recipe I liked and I can do it well and خلاص, I'm fine. And and it's funny because my brother used to make fun of me and say, Ente, every day you have something new. Why don't you just stick to something? And I felt ashamed because I never stuck to something. And now I realize who says I have to stick to something? I can learn something new every week. If it's not my job, it's not important. And also all this learning benefits me in everything I do. It's like Steve Jobs said, when he learned calligraphy, he perfected uh, his computer. Who says you only have to learn computer? I think there's an artist inside of you because you love to create and you love to learn. And it's there is this instinct artist of like, I want to build and make and touch and expand my knowledge. And I wanted to segue into color and vibrancy because in all your interviews and even sometimes on social media, you wear the brightest colors, yellow and orange. And today you're wearing a floral outfit. So where does this love of color come from? And are you aware that you love color? It's integrated in your in your wardrobe and in your life. Like the garden that you spend time in is, is full of colors. So is color a theme in your life? I think color is a revenge for many years of, I call them my years of beige. Every single woman I, I speak to, when I say my years of beige, they get it and they giggle. Because we all have our years of black or our years of beige. So um, I used to wear gray, brown, not. I remember going to, I mean, she passed away, she was 80 at the time, to one of the top therapists. She was a, a, an aromatherapist. She was very famous in the UK. She was French origin. And she looked at me, she says, you're wearing brown. I said, yes. She said, brown is a bad mix of color. Wear gray, wear black, do not wear brown because it affects your vibration, your body vibration, your mental vibration. So that was, and she said, if you wear brown or any color, she says, you know, if you want to wear brown, wait, wear it down, don't wear it next to your face. I think that's when I started, that's when I started leaving the grays and browns and, and, and blacks. And then I went into white. And then I think I was going through the most blah years of my life. Seriously, blah. I don't want to even remember them, but I don't remember them. They were, I was just unconscious of what was happening. It was just very numb, very numb. And I used to wear camel and beige all the time. Until one day I realized, oh my God, all my clothes are beige. Oh, my, my friend actually came in and said to me, what happened to you? And I said, what? She goes, why is everything beige? And and, and that was another shock. Everything yeah. beige. 
And then I started dappling into a little bit of color here, a little bit of color here, a little bit of color here. And now I don't know if I could ever go back to no color. I, I don't have black, beige, gray. I do have gray garden pants, but I don't have gray clothes. I don't have anything black, not even shoes. I, I think I gave away my last pair of beige shoes. I think colors lift you. They lift your energy. And it says so much about your personality, the colors that you choose. Because to wear color, you have to have, you be very courageous. And so it's the, the opposite of being, of, of hiding. You have, you know, it's if you find you have a tendency to hide, wear color. Force yourself to wear color because it will force you to come out of your comfort zone. يعني الحين قلتي تصدقين I breathed لأن I always wear black and I'm like why am I always wearing black unknowingly sometimes you want to hide yeah or we want to um يعني shrink or or be smaller or or fade you know totally I totally get that if you want to really push your boundaries force yourself to wear color literally Okay, so there's a few more questions before we before we wrap up. One of the most fascinating things that you mentioned was that I saw in one of your videos was the fact that you used to hit your daughters after the invasion and then that's what also all that anger was bubbling and then that got you to or motivated you to seek therapy. And also you mentioned earlier about your divorce, which is a really taboo subject. In one of our earlier podcasts, we did an interview with uh, Dr. Samaya Hashim, who's doing her whole PhD on divorced women from the Arab world and entrepreneurship and how divorced women are shunned by other women they are judged they become like lepers in society nobody wants to we perceive what we believe i'm twice divorced and uh, uh, my second divorce after my second divorce after a, a few years a man who's arab origin who lives in america he's been he's been in america since he was 18 so he's, he, he's now american he got divorced a second time And both his wives are American. And he calls me up and he says, Antasar. I said, what? And he says, what did people think of you or say to you when you got your second divorce? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. So what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, I never listened. What they think about me is up to them. What I think about me is up to me. If I cared what people thought of me, I would live what they want me to, to, the way they want me to live. I wasn't feeling well. I wasn't happy. I was miserable. I chose to leave. That's it. He's a good man. I'm not saying he's a good or a bad man. It's just, it, it stopped making sense to be together. And I said, why are you, you're in America. Why do you, why do you care? And he says, yeah, but what will people say? And that's when I realized it's got nothing to do with society. It's got everything to do with what you think is right or wrong. So we can say, yes, Arab society shuns divorced women, but it also is probably not true. But if I feel bad because I'm divorced, I'm going to project that on everything I see. So yeah, my friend's not talking to me. I'm divorced. Oh, eh, I'm divorced. Like seriously, let's get over it. When we stop judging people, they stop judging us. What a liberating, liberating way of looking at it. I love it. When, so, when we think someone is looking at us in a certain way, let's think, let's go back and realize we've done that to other people in one way or the other before. Let go of that thought and no one thinks of you in that way. Take responsibility for your thoughts. Take responsibility for what happens to you and what you do to other people. I mean, that's that's really, 
I mean, that's a, these are very big thoughts and, and I really admire and respect you for sharing those because they are generally taboo subjects and people shy away from them. And I think when we did the Women Power Summit, one of the most powerful sessions was about a, يعني, Dictora, she's a surgeon and she was, we had a panel with all these doctors. So she was on a panel and then basically she was saying, and all I want to do is work and she's had a divorce and her husband was very jealous of her career. So he basically uh, locked her in the house And he was also a surgeon and he's like, you're not going to work. And she's like, I called my mother. My mother came, opened the window, threw my keys in of my, you know, of, uh, for the house. I got out. I had a spare of the car key and I went to work to do my surgery. And no one's going to ever stop me from working. And that was one of the, like, people were clapping because no one talks about these moments or these profound moments in, in a relationship that we you know put it under the rug we we kind of move over them or glaze over them so it was a very profound moment and a very liberating one one thing i'm 100 sure of is the world is our, a mirror of our thoughts so when i think uh, other women are jealous of me it's because i'm jealous of other women when i think people are not trustworthy is because I am not trustworthy or I feel or I believe I'm not trustworthy. It might be trustworthy in another uh, arena altogether, but it's the feeling of trustworthy. So when, when I feel, I look at someone and I have a negative feeling, I realize, oh my God, that's what I think of myself. Oh my God, I have to stop it. You would not recognize the color blue if you've never seen it before, right? If I tell you blue and you've never seen blue, you can say, what? If I describe it, you've never seen it, you'll never get it. But when I say blue and you understand it, it's because you know it. You've done it. You realize what it is. The reality is we have to get out of this victim stage, victim mindset. Till when are we going to victimize ourselves for being women, victimize ourselves for being Arabs, victimize ourselves for being wives, victimize ourselves for having bosses? Like seriously, get out of it. Live life to the fullest. And when you feel it's not fair, change your thoughts. You use the word kindness in a lot of your speeches. So this is kind of like my final question because you always have this, you're like the messenger of peace, which is very powerful. And my last question is, we need to give kindness to give kindness. So what could we do as individuals, especially during this time, to support one another? Every morning when you wake up, go to the mirror, look at yourself and say, I love you. And, and you know, it, were, it also is an, a, an added bonus to hug yourself and be grateful to you. That in itself is going to support other women. You see, once you're kind to yourself, you'll find so many ways of being kind to people. So many. Because if we think we have to be kind to people and not start with ourselves, it's out of ego. And I am so much better than you are, and I have to be kind to you. But when it starts with yourself, then everything's a reflection of what you feel, right? And so it becomes very easy to be kind. And you don't even have to logicize it. You don't have to, to even think about it. It just comes out automatically because you find so many avenues of being kind. Kindness is not thinking... A woman is out there to get your job or is, is, she's jealous of you or, you know, women don't do, don't, are not good bosses or women are the worst employees. I used to think all of these until I started being kind to myself, loving myself. And I realized women don't want to hurt women. Men don't want to hurt women. No one wants to hurt anyone else. It's just a perception. So the message is... Give yourself a, a nice hug in the morning. Look at yourself. Look at your eyes and and truly, truly say to yourself, I love you. I don't remember if I've ever done that, actually, but I think I will. It's hard in the beginning Some for some people. For some, it's easier. But it has to be a genuine I love you. It's not like, oh, I love you. No. You have to really look and really connect with that face that you see. 
look in the eyes and say, I love you. And when you can see it, when you can say it with an open heart, then you know you've gotten there. And you can say it with that inner smile. Not, oh, I love you. Oh, my God, you're the... No, no, no. See, that's, that's acting. Genuine, gentle kindness. And it becomes so easy to be kind to others because everyone's a reflection of you. I really want to thank you for being you. I'm grateful that you come to the table every day with your vulnerability, with your realness, with your nowness, with your humbleness to, you know, you're a teacher, but you're also a student and it's a wonderful mix. I thank you for sharing these vulnerable stories in other interviews and even here about your family, about some of the challenges that you faced even coming out on social, but sharing your story. And I think every day that you do that, you make people like me a bit more braver, a bit more stronger. And I think if there's anything I'd want people to take away from this is it's okay to be seen. It's okay to be heard. It's okay to love yourself. And I think these are really powerful me messages. So I really, really want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. It was wonderful. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power Podcast. And thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Women Power Podcast and the Women Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it for me. See you next week.